bugger. Bugger, says the Oxford Don, frustrated by the trek he's on. I was the one who sent him off, this unwary classics prof, my friend Taplin, off to trace the myth of Orpheus all through Thrace, Bulgaria, as it is today, where Orpheus is now called Orphe, the sign we see on this cafe. I told him, scholarship like yours could open those locked Orphic doors. Bugger! In 98, the year before, I'd done my own Bulgarian tour, starting with this Orpheus here. Not much noticed in Sofia. Orpheus, torn apart, dismembered, sings again when he's remembered, or finds some modern devotee of the powerless power of poetry. Gerbera, yellow, orange, red, I place behind Orpheus's head. Call his name or bring him flowers, sun-coloured, to restore his powers. Orphe. Orphe. Honour Orphe, and you'll hear his voice in traffic choke. Sophia. Warfare. Though over two millennia dead, it still sings his dismembered head, the head of Orpheus, that head hacked when Orpheus Orphe was attacked by Thracian women who hacked Orphe. because he was the world's first gay. And bugger, bugger, they yelled at him when they tore Orpheus limb from limb. I honoured Orpheus. Look, this snap you know, shows my flowers in the poet's lap. Gerbera, to seal the line running from his muse to mine. Oliver, you ought to trace the myth of Orpheus all through Thrace, Bulgaria as it is today. Follow his hacked head all the way down the Hebros to the sea, then to Lesbos, spouting poetry. You've got the leisure and long vax to follow in Orpheus's tracks. Go on the journey I went on. It's a great trip for a classics don. Food's good. Wine. You could have a trip half scoffing and half scholarship. 
You know my notebooks, how I glue every image, each small clue, doodle lines, in case one day I make a film about uh, Orphea. Look at all this stuff I've stuck into my new Orpheus book. Every Orphic twist and turn has been collected, as you know, by Kern. Orphic Orum Fragmenta. Read those Greek texts, it's all you need. And broken icons of the bar, scattered on cracked pot and shard. The coins. Those excavated clues you classicists know how to use. Scholarship like Kern's and yours could open those locked Orphic doors. Uh, that's sort of long redone, that, that head. Still making music, though it's dead. In, in the Rodopis, you could even trace ancient Orpheus in a modern face. These are some Orpheus's uh, from my book, but he's every bloody where you look. He's there in constant metamorphosis. Look at this. And this. And this. Look, even gooey Orpheus chocks with Cyrillic Orphe on the box. Well, at least on this trip, I'm not going to have that bloody bard looking over my shoulder the whole time and holding forth in sobbing rhyme. Typical scholar scoffs his fill then leaves the poet to pay the bill. I bet of all my Orphic clues, the chocks will be the first he'll choose. Some Bulgarian broad leaves it for research. Hmm. Tony didn't tell me about this underworld in the hotel. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he came down here looking for Eurydice. I'm intrigued by that version of the myth that says that Orpheus was the world's first gay. But by far the best known story is how he went down and charmed the powers of Hades into letting him take his wife Eurydice back from the dead. He looked round at her, of course, and had to return to our world without her. But in my researches, I've been looking into the early myth, and I've found that the ancient Greeks themselves were far more concerned with what happened after that, with his violent death. It's all very well that bloody bard telling me to do this and do that. But tracking the Orpheus myth on the ground is going to mean a long climb. High into the Rodopi Mountains, south of Sofia. After the women up there had hacked him to pieces, they threw his head and his lyre into the river Maritza. I'm going right back to the source. The reason why the Greek myths are so potent, why they underlie so many of our basic stories, must surely be that they have this potential for metamorphosis to be endlessly remade, recycled in new forms. But I have a new approach which may reveal something about the strength of these mythical roots. The more I think about them, the more I become fascinated by the way that although they are stories of the imagination, they're not set in some imaginary world, but in the distant past of real places. And I always want to ask, why this particular landscape for this particular myth? With Orpheus, one starting point is that he lived in the remote mountains of Thrace, that's more or less present-day Bulgaria. Another, he was not a warrior like nearly all the other Greek heroes. He was a poet and a musician. And linking these, the power of his performance was so strong that it could cross conventional boundaries. It could even reach beyond the human world to the natural world.
There's no definitive version of how or why the women ripped the poet to pieces. The texts about Orpheus are all rather like him, dismembered fragments. But I've excavated one especially intriguing version, not by a famous authority, but by an obscure poet from the 3rd century BC called Phanicles. Phanicles was fed up with the traditional tales of gods and heroes falling for mortal women and told stories instead of their love for beautiful young men, a gay reformulation of the Greek myths, I suppose. Only one fragment of his poem survives, and it so happens that it tells the Orpheus story and how the women hacked him to pieces because instead of fancying them, he was in love with a beautiful boy, Calais. Often he would sit in the shady groves singing of his desire and his spirit was never at rest. But always his unsleeping passion ate away at his spirit. Soul. Ate away at his soul when he looked at youthful Calais. But the malicious Thracian women surrounded and killed him, wetting their sharp blades because... there and say who sings in the stream They cut off his head with their blades and threw it into the water along with his Thracian tortoiseshell lyre. Thracian women, Thracian lyre. This myth is different from most in the way that it's not set in the heartlands of the Greek world but in the wild fringes. Maybe that fits with his not being conventional in his sexuality. It's as though Orpheus was trying to bring unfamiliar poetry to the wild margins. I have a guidebook through the twists and turns of my obsession. It's Orphicorum Fragmenta, the work of Otto Kern, a German scholar at the beginning of this century, who devoted years of his life to collecting every single fragment of ancient Greek that has anything to do with Orpheus. I wonder whether anyone before me has brought these dry pages into Orpheus's own territory. My friend, the pontificating poet, is trying to put Orpheus back together by assembling bits and pieces in his notebooks. And in his different way, Kern the scholar was trying to reassemble him out of the fragments of texts. Now I, in my turn, to find a shape to my journey, I have to pick out a piece here and a piece there from Kern's pages. In Kern, I find Orpheus the lover and Orpheus the leader of a cult. There are many religious texts collected here from the later Orphic religion, but First, and running through all, Orpheus the poet, whose singing even survived his death.
The central city of the plain of Thrace, far older and more interesting than the capital Sofia, is Plovdiv. When Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, eventually conquered the ancient Thracians, he named this city after himself, Philippopolis. The modern Bulgarians, even though they arrived long after the era of ancient Greece, have claimed Orpheus as their own. You see his name and image all over the place. Yet I've ransacked the libraries for pictorial fragments, for images of Orpheus that go back to the ancient days of Philippopolis, and I've been able to track down only one in the whole of Bulgaria, a picture as small as my wristwatch. Welcome. Oh, glad to meet you. That's the director of the museum, Mr. Peko. So you came to the right place because uh, Plovdiv is closely linked to Orpheus. Yes. Maritza, what the scala? А единственото място, където има скала Крей Марица в Траке, това е един хълм тук на три хълми тук в град Пловдив. Освен това има и един квартал на града през римската епоха, който the Christian Norfe. Yes, and one he of the divisions of the city was called Orpheus as well. Right. And you have the coin? Yes. Oh, good. Let's uh, see what we can find on it. Right. Oh. I've been waiting to see this. Mm -hmm. Don't the check as he doesn't <laughs> win. So on one side we have a Roman emperor. Yes. Uh, Geta. Geta. Mm -hmm. And then the other side, this is what we're looking for. Ah. This is Orpheus here, sitting with his lyre on a rock. That must represent the Rhodope Mountains, his home. And here, all around him, are various animals and birds listening. So, the cafe epigraphic pamentnik, the Verkusidalka, the Bolifterion, the antique Philippop. And you can see a sign Orpheus in the Greek theatre in the centre of the city now. Where are these inscriptions? or One of the groupings in the city. The Orpheus tribe. This one is Odor. Odopidos, the ro ah, that must be that must be a, an R missing. Rodopis, Rodopis, and Hebros. So the city was divided into administrative divisions, which would sit together in the theatre. One of those was named after Orpheus, another after the Rodope Mountains, and another after the river which his head floated down. The river of the Orpheus story is the Maritza, the Maritza it is in Bulgaria. When it reaches Greece, it's the Evros or Hebros in ancient Greek. From here, the river sweeps on through the agricultural plain and industrialized cities of central Bulgaria.
I followed Orpheus eastwards about 200 miles and around here, Svilingrad, where Mustafa Pasha, the Turkish ruler, built this fantastic 13 arch bridge in the early 16th century. Around here, the river turns to the south to the, towards the sea. And um, within a couple of miles of here, on the left bank, the Turkish border, where the Maritza becomes the Meric, and on the right-hand bank, the Greek border, where the Meritza becomes the Ephros, or, or Hebros. And from this bridge, from this bridge... My name! My name! <laughs> My name called as I pass by means poetry will never die. Means poetry will never die. Bulgarians, I float your way. Tell me who I am. Oh, Your voices give power back to me. The power sound of poetry. And the name I hear them cry from the bridge as I pass by. Well, bugger me, that's Orpheus. And it's the image from that painted cup in Berlin, but without the outlandish Thracian audience. I suppose a Greek sign might not want to advertise the foreign audience of adoring male admirers in their myth. And this buffet must have been through changes, because within the last hundred years, this railway station has been Turkish and Bulgarian before it became Greek. This whole area has been bedeviled by nationalist claims and wars and ethnic cleansings. I can tell the Greeks are still very sensitive about it. 
After all, it is Turkey just over there. The Turks conquered Didimotiko, a key fortress in the Evros Valley, in 1361, and immediately Sultan Murad I set about building a mighty mosque here to mark the conquest. And the Turks ruled this part of the world for 550 years. It wasn't until 1923, after all the turmoil of the Balkan Wars and the First World War, that finally the Evros River was made the frontier between Greece and Turkey. And it still is the frontier, and it's in fact a military zone. No civilians are allowed to go there, and no one is allowed to photograph there. As the Evros reaches the sea, its main branch flows past the Turkish town of Enes on the site of the ancient Greek Ainos. But now it's split into innumerable streams to form a great delta some seven miles across. I've located some fragments of poetry in my trusty guidebook Otto Kern, which must, I think, have been inspired by the flew above Orpheus' head and the fish jumped out of the water at the beauty of his song. There's another which is actually addressed to the river Hebros. It was dug up on a scrap of papyrus from Egypt and it's, we've only got the first two stanzas and even those have got bits missing. It's by the poet Alcaeus or Alcaeus, who came from the island of Lesbos. Hebros, your finest of rivers as you flow past Ainos, huh? From the mouth of the river, the head drifts out across the sea, and the story has it floating to the island of Lesbos. Why there? It's a long way away from here. Why should the hero who never fought in wars, who explored sexuality, the poet, why should he have ended up on Lesbos? Well, Harrison told me to search, and that's what I'm going to have to do, even if it means 10 hours on the ferry. The head and the lyre were born out to sea together, soaked by the grey surge. The sea filled the sea and the salt splashed shores, uh, filled the sea and the briny shores. 
That's how the poem by Phanicles goes on, the poem in which Orpheus is torn to pieces by the Thracian women because he's turned to the love of boys. So his head is borne over the seas, past the islands, and the main island in between Thrace and Lesbos is the island of Samothrace, which is in fact the highest island in the whole of the Aegean. There's a nice passage I found in Kern which says that as the head sang its way across the seas, the wind blew on the strings of the lyre to play accompaniment, and so it was carried to Lesbos with music. tradition was that the place on the northern shore of Lesbos where the head was washed up was Antissa, once a flourishing city, now a remote headland. Back in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, Lesbos produced more than its fair share of great poets. There was Topandros from Antissa. He made important musical innovations. There was Orion from Methymna. He charmed the dolphins into saving him from drowning. Alcaios from Mytilene, important and powerful poetry of politics and of love, and Sappho from Erosos, Sappho the Tenth Muse, whose love poetry to her girlfriends gave the name of Lesbos to love between women. Some say a squadron of cavalry, some of infantry, and some a fleet of ships is the most glorious sight on this dark earth. But I say it is the woman you desire a fragment of a poem by Sappho. Her poetry only exists in fragments because later authorities, teachers and priests wouldn't allow her poems of lesbian love to be copied or studied. We have them mainly from tattered scraps of papyrus excavated from the sands of Egypt. She has in her way, like Orpheus, been torn to pieces for not conforming and yet has survived. This is how the Phanicles poem ends the journey. And the grey sea brought them ashore on Lesbos. There, the men gave funeral rites to the mellifluous head of Orpheus, and they set his melodious lyre in his tomb, the lyre which used to charm the rocks and the cruel sea. And his songs and lovely music filled the isle, and so Lesbos became the most poetic of all islands. Commandment broken souls that men's deeds rend. When men are maimed and torn apart, they'll call on Orpheus and his heart. Time's tide once more made strong, but only when you hear my song. Obeos, obeos. Your voice gives power back to me. The powerless power of
sun and sea in Gerbera hues salute to this servant of the muse. Gerbera, orange, yellow, red, flow in the sunset round his head. Though the head is dead and cold, the voice still turns shed blood to gold. The voice that heals and seeks to mend men's broken souls that men's deeds rend. When men are maimed and torn apart, they'll call on Orpheus and his art. I think it needs that ancient scream to pierce the skulls of academe, to remind them all our poems start in the scream of Orpheus torn apart. And so Lesbos became, and so Lesbos is, the most poetic of all islands. Oliver Taplin! What the f are you doing on Ledge Boss? Shh! We're filming! Sorry, love. Fargo! That bloody bard Harrison 